Uh, you brought up a very important point. Your daughter was with you. Did she have uh, different questions to you? Did, did you find it helpful to get her perspective on all this? Or was she really there just to kind of listen? No, she, I was time very time. interested in her perspective. She's a clinical social worker, so she sort of gets the psychology of all of this. And knowing that I, who like to be in charge, one, I was needing to say to myself, you're not in charge of this. Let it go. Let your daughter be useful to you. And so how important it was for her to ask questions. And she asked questions of the doctor. It was very interesting because Dr. Bella was new to Washington. And uh, he looks very young. And so my daughter very artfully said, well, Dr. Bella, what is your background? <laughs> and I would never have thought to even ask that. I just wanted to get on with the surgery. And so she asked the question, and so Dr. Bellow gave it an obvious, very assuring answer. Which is so important, isn't it, to know whether the doctor you're seeing is an expert in the field, what's their level of experience, and we'll certainly talk about that in terms of surgical experience. And you know, and they used to ask me, aren't you too young to be, and I, they, no one has asked me that. <laughs> really? Long, you know, it's just tearing me up. Well, they, yes, but uh, <laughs> fortunately, she had a cooler head. Now, she was going through her own drama with this because you, here's your mother, and your mother suddenly is not who you thought your mother was. But to have her be at the hospital at 5 in the morning, be and sit through the whole experience and be there with me afterward, and then with the first uh, doctor visit afterward, uh, it was so assuring to me. And the sense I had was very assuring to her. And one element to that was how do you communicate this information? And you know, you have networks of friends, and so do you have a party and tell them all, or do you just keep it quiet to yourself? I had decided that through experiences with other friends who had gone through some type of cancer, that I would use that nonprofit web link of the Caring Bridge. And so we, my daughter and I literally put up there, you know, a lot of people that we thought might be interested in knowing what was happening to me at this moment. And then Kirsten every day uh, put, a, put something up on Caring Bridge. And by doing that, I didn't have to be the front end of managing everybody's reactions, including my own. And we could keep it funny and keep it so Almost they, a distraction, healthy distraction. Oh, healthy distraction. And so she would write up something, then she would say, is this okay to put up on Caring Bridge of what's, where you are today in, in your uh, recovery, particularly when I was in the hospital? So um, it's a way of being able to communicate with people without you, me, having to be that person on the front end. You've got a middle manager. I do want to get on to talking about some of the surgical aspects shortly, but before we do, I just want to pick up on something you said, that you were the patient, and yet, as so many patients say, they're as concerned about how the news of a cancer diagnosis affects their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And we've talked already about the multidisciplinary team and how important that is to help patients with support, with oncology nurse practitioners, with dietitians, with cancer experts, social workers, to address not just the medical, but the psychological and the financial issues that many patients face. And we've covered many of these topics on Cure Connections already. Um, but the multidisciplinary team also offers a huge support network, does it not, for the caregiver that we mustn't forget is in this as well. Absolutely. This is a diagnosis for the family and husband, wife, or family, uh, you know, the, the nuclear family, if you will. Um, it's they need a team too, um, uh, an emotional, a physical, you know, note taker, all of those pieces. And we as medical professionals recognize that when we give some individual or a couple uh, information, almost always, particularly in today's social media world, we know that information is trickling out. So uh, to, to a, a village, uh, a network right. of that fam friends and family, uh, whether it's posting on Facebook or uh, Twitter feed or uh, a, a, a web page. Um, and so um, we want that. I actually worry when it's not back there. 
Uh, there are people, though, who are private, and we have to recognize that, that they don't want work to know. They don't want a kid or a, a parent to know. And so we do have to respect that on our end. Um, and we all, for patients, they have to remember we can't really communicate directly to those people right. without the individual's right. permission under HIPAA rules. So th those are things that if you are worried about your information and don't want us to communicate, uh, we won't unless right. you give us the nod. And, and often it's hard to remember that when you're dealing with many patients throughout a busy week. And it's interesting you talk about information trickling out. Mm -hmm to the wider family, but information also trickles back when family and friends chime in and say, ask your doctor this, and yeah. uh, you know, my brother said maybe I, his best friend had this treatment, am I eligible for that? So we also have to filter in information, well-meant well information. Sometimes it's not always accurate or even relevant to the patient. I so often have patients come in with articles that they've been given by family members from, they've, cuttings out of a newspaper saying, am I eligible for this treatment? And mm. even though it's the same disease, it, it, they're not, it's not relevant to their stage of disease. Yeah. Do you oh, find that? Oh, absolutely. Or, or, you know, someone, I was going to sort of joke, it's always the daughter who sends an email and says, you know, I don't care what mom tells you, this is really how she is. <laughs> yeah. um, and, or they'll both be there and you'll be asking the patient how she's doing and the daughter will be sitting there going, you know, it's <laughs> not true, not true. So it's always these dynamics of a worried family member, quite honestly, and having to filter that in, am I seeing somebody dressed up for the doctor who's really worse off, or am I seeing a worried family member right, right. who just wants to make sure we've covered all the bases uh, in you, a visit? You bring up a very interesting point about body language mm. from both sides, that we're looking at patient and family members as how the information is received, but they're also looking at us. It's not just the words we say, but how we say them, whether we say that, you know, this is good news, yeah. X, or, you know, I've got some difficult mm -hmm. information to discuss with you. Dr. Baezi, I'm going to bring you in.